thank you very much. That was that was a great update. Uh, for the next talk, we'll have John joining us in just a minute. And we are not alone here. Hello, John. Hey, how are you guys? Good. good. <laughs> how are you? Nice to see you guys. We, yeah. We'd like to ask you about all the things you've been doing since appearing at the at the previous F Sharp Conf, but we don't have time for this. So you'll 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 have to answer all the questions on YouTube, and let's just get to, get will, to that will, your yes. talk about scientific computing. Yeah. Yes, it's been fun. Actually, this is uh, quite an interesting uh, uh, sort of segue. It's not my day job, but it's still something I do for fun, very much like uh, F Sharp itself. Um, I do have uh, some slides. Um, how do I? There's a share button somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Just present. Present at the bottom. Let me see here. There's no a... problem. No problem. This is, this is people who do qu quantum computing during the day. <laughs> there, there's their computers are always in a super position. <laughs> I'm making this joke because uh, John was John was talking about quantum computing at the recent FSR call. Yes, that's We've right. Got a recording of that. Yeah. Your your slides are now sharing and not sharing. Yeah. <laughs> um, am I shared function. or not? Um, Let's see. I don't think we see it there yet. No, no. no. How about now? No, here we go. Okay, so stage oh, well, is okay. yours. So I can actually figure this stuff out. Very, very, very nice. All right. So um, let so let me. Um, so I've, I've been involved in the F-Sharp community for some time now, uh, having a lot of fun actually doing F-Sharp. Um, in fact, it was one of the um, the languages that um, sort of rekindled my, my interest in programming and stuff like that. Um, and then after many sort of detours over the last few years, as Thomas mentioned, uh, you know, we find ourselves in this scenario where like, you know, there's scientific computing all over the place, machine learning and all of that. And then we have to ask the question about whether, you know, uh, F-Sharp has a place in that field, whether we should be just, you know, using Python or R or some other language to do stuff or whether we can actually use F-Sharp. So um, I decided that I'd work with a few of my old colleagues in the who are all bona fide scientists, you know, PhDs in their own fields and everything, and, uh, and actually try to uh, express some of what they were saying with the F-Sharp language and try to bring sort of what F-Sharp had to offer to the table and see if it's a, there's a good fit, right? Um, I had uh, an about me slide, which I will actually just delight. I Basically, I'm a, a principal engineer at Microsoft. And like I said, uh, I've been working, um, you know, in, in, this ki in this kind of industry for some time. Um, I'll not to not to bury the lead in the in the in the, in the actual conversation that we're going to take. Um, the key takeaways I want you to walk away with is is that F# -sharp is actually an excellent language for developing um, math and science pro programs, and in fact, it has some unique language features that we can use. And uh, in fact, I'm going to give you some demonstration of that, um, you know, soon. Um, there's an interesting and funny story about performance using F Sharp. It turns out it's not an issue, but you have to be a little careful, and you don't really want to uh, um, uh, do what I did. So, uh, and of course, uh, the reason why we want to do any of the stuff is because F Sharp is really fun. So let's let's go around here. Uh, I want to acknowledge a few people. I'll just put the slide up, and we'll move on with this. The first problem we want to talk about is something called the Ising model. Now, this thing is a uh, an interesting little thing where um, it's a simply, it's a very simple to express model of magnetism. And uh, it just basically depends on local neighbor interactions on a lattice. And you can basically uh, show that when you do simulated annealing, you can kind of explain why magnetism takes place because everything kind of wants to kneel down to the ground state um, and so on. But there's a twist in the tail here. This Ising model actually allows you to uh, solve some extremely difficult problems. There's a, uh, there's a well-known paper, which I'll link to at the bottom, where you can literally map um, all NP-complete problems to solutions of an Ising spin glass. Uh, spin glass is a special type of Ising model where 
the coefficients of interaction between the local neighbors are not constant. If they are constant and they perform certain and they have certain characteristics, then you get magnetism. But if you don't, you get something called an Ising spin glass, which you can use to solve like super difficult problems. Um, so learning how to build a little Ising model thing with F sharp is kind of a very good idea. I was going to show you that code. Here is an example of how we would implement a, a simpleizing model in F sharp. And it's a little bit more involved. Uh, I hope you can see the screen. I really can't see what, what is being shown. Um, I hope you can see the screen. Um, but this is a model where you can basically build a two-dimensional lattice and try to simulate how it becomes a magnet at a lower temperature. And the way we do that is quite uniquely different in F-sharp because we can sort of take advantage of things like units of measure and set up very strongly typed domain systems which prevent us from basically abusing the flexibility of using integers and, in and Boolean values as we would in other languages. So for example, spin is typically when you when you when you model it in a different language, you model it as a Boolean value and set its value to true or false. But then you never really want to do Boolean algebra with with spins, with the exception of being able to flip a spin. You don't want to actually do Boolean algebra. Um, so we can prevent that kind of thing from happening, and thereby make our code a lot safer by ensuring that um, you know we use a, a properly uh, defined type for this. Now, this may sound like a lot of overhead, but it turns out that by doing this, you can actually implement a full-blown uh, Metropolis model, which is uh, a, a, me a method of randomly trying to cool the system and see if we have to flip uh, spins so that we get a low energy state. We do that in a, uh, in a, in a sort of random way. Um, and that entire solution is less than 150 lines of code. And the code actually models the, the scientific paper very closely. And in fact, you can see that you can use the type checking from the units of measure to make sure that the values that you get make sense. So a physicist could look at this and say, hey, you know, this number that you're getting here has the right units. So you must be doing at least some operations that sound reasonable, as opposed to just having a bunch of doubles and potentially dividing the wrong numbers with each other, where you won't have a clue about how to debug whether your system is actually doing the right thing. And this is these are some of the benefits that you get from using F# -sharp because some of the uh, idiosyncratic features that F# -sharp has make it much better to use. So if we now, it doesn't look like my slides actually moved. Yeah, so why F sharp makes this good is that we have a strongly typed domain, which basically prevents us from uh, doing incorrect operations by applying type logic on top of it. And the idiomatic operations like flipping a spin can be represented quite succinctly and powerfully in the language. So you can do the functionality that you want, prevent the functionality that you don't, and actually work out in a very nice and uh, terse, expressive way, um, a solution that is also safe. And you can check whether it's going to work correctly. So this is one of those tiny little examples where uh, I happened to show this to uh, Helmut Katzgraber, who was kind of like the godfather of of using the Ising model to solve difficult problems. And his first reaction was, wow, this stuff is so clean. Uh, there's like no noise in the code. And that I think is a very good thing. Um, however, um, I, it would not be an F-sharp talk from me if I didn't point out what we ought to do to the language to make it better. And in this particular case, we parameterize the entire Ising model by what the interaction matrix is. And in fact, that's the interesting bit because when you change the interaction matrix, you change the nature of the problem. 
And if you want to model an NP-complete problem and try to use this mechanism to do something, you need to provide an interactive matrix. And we can't parameterize modules by doing this. And so uh, it would be nice if we had like, uh, you know, parametric modules, and then we can basically uh, generalize this code to be uh, super powerful. You could basically just implement the, 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 the code in one place and, and pass in the parameters and, and, and you're good to go. Right, we're just about on time. Uh, I will let, talk about, okay, let's talk about performance here. This is an interesting problem that we ran into actually. So when I first ran the code, I uh, ran, I wrote it in F sharp, I wrote it in Rust. I expected Rust to be like super fast. Uh, I, you know, we were, we were looking for, you know, high performance and all of that. Um, I got my Rust code reviewed by a friend of mine who is like a, a Rust expert. And he gave me some ideas. They do have the ability to uh, supply dependent types. So I was able to parameterize that with, you know, uh, a specific, you know, dimension size and so on. And then I ran the code and inexplicably the F-sharp code was 40 times faster. It just blew my mind. And I was, I was so shocked by this that I immediately tweeted it, which is, as we'll realize, the wrong thing to do. And just as I finished pressing tweet and coming back to looking at what was going on, I realized that the, the F-sharp code was running in optimized mode um, and uh, the Rust code was not. So the moment I made Rust um, you know, run in release mode, it was 2x as fast as F-sharp and you know, all was right with the world and I was feeling sort of nice for myself, but I, I landed up, um, um, I landed up just playing with the, comp the profiler for a bit and realized that f -sharp was actually doing a whole bunch of unnecessary initialization simply because I had misunderstood an interesting language feature. It turns out that f -sharp augmentations, record augmentations, don't have fields. They just have properties that get recomputed every time you call them. And so I was recomputing a whole bunch of initialization code every time. And now when I fixed that, F sharp was faster than Rust. And that's really what we want to have. But every step of this process was, you know, I was, I was doing the stuff, learning something, getting excited about it, tweeting it, and giving people whiplash. Ultimately, uh, I got a tweet from Don saying, please check your perf results before you tweet them. Otherwise you risk giving us all heart attacks. And so this is a, an interesting, funny object lesson that, that uh, you might want to take on board uh, if you want to do your scientific computing with F-sharp. Everyone will support you, uh, but um, sort of contain the, uh, the astonishment and, and everything until you actually understand what's going on. And then you won't, you won't have Don basically um, gently correcting you in, in in view of like millions of people. So that, that's kind of a fun, fun aside. The next problem we're trying to solve is gradient descent. Now this, this again has the same nature or uh, it's the same sort of flavor of problem. And it turns out that all NP-complete problems being what they are interchangeable in some degree, you'll end up with a situation where um, you have a kind of energy landscape and part of your problem, part of the solution to the problem is to try and find the sort of local or global minima in that landscape, because that gives you the ground state of the system and, and it describes the system when, it, when you have a solution. And, and so the Ising model has a similar kind of mechanism. Other optimization problems also have this thing. And this idea of, using gradient descent to find the fastest way down the hill to find the place where you might find the best solution is a very common problem. Now, of course, in machine learning, gradient descent is an extremely important mainstay in there. And if you visualize things in two or three dimensions, you'll be able to see sort of a contour plot and you can draw something and get the intuition for it. But really when we deal with, with gradient descent in, in machine learning and in other areas, you're talking about, you know, very high dimension vector spaces, and you're not talking about two or three dimensions. You could be in the thousands of dimensions. And now you have to deal with taking partial derivatives of, 
of matrices to, to get to where you need to go. And so that's like super complicated. It starts to get really insane in terms of the maths and so on. But we can, you know, we are, we are not done yet. So what we're going to do is we're going to write a little gradient descent um, uh, module for linear regression, which is a very simple sort of, but very powerful sort of model. It's a very first step in machine learning, for example, is to learn how to do linear regression with gradient descent. But we're not doing it with one variable. We're going to do it as a vector thing. And we're going to do it in F sharp. And we're going to take advantage of the fact that there is a library that does the linear algebra for us. So I'm going to walk you through the code again. Um, but this time, I'm not going to stay on the nitty gritty of the code that's being executed. We're going to just talk about um, some general features. So let me let me um, let me show you the, the code. So so in here, uh, we let's just start by pointing out that this code is only 250 lines long, less than 250 lines long, and it has with it again complete definitions in the in the vernacular of machine learning specialists, what you would generally find. For example, an input vector is a vector. It's a vector of some features with an intercept built in. So if somebody just gives you the features, you generally have to put in the intercept uh, with a value of one, and then you basically interact with that uh, as a separate kind of entity than something that doesn't have an intercept. Well. You can quite easily see that if you mix things up, since both of them are just arrays, you know, representing vectors, uh, it's very easy to get mixed up about whether you're dealing with a, a, um, a value that has an intercept or does not. And again, F sharp does a, a job of giving us the ability to specify that an input vector will have always an intercept. And other vectors may not. And you can't interchange between the two of them. This is another interesting piece where we use something that uh, structurally can be described as convertible to float. And we take advantage of that to write some very succinct code. And again, if you go through this entire thing, the most expensive piece in terms of understanding what's going on is making sure that uh, we correctly type the domain in a way that gives us safety. So even though input vectors and parameter vectors are structurally the same, there are operations that don't make sense on multiple input vectors. But there's an operation that makes sense between a parameter vector and input vector. And we can express that as that dot product over here which fundamentally means that we can write very, very clean, straightforward code that actually looks like the math that you're trying to solve. So I'll give you a clear example of that in a minute. But at the end of the day, this code in 250 lines, we have actually implemented four different variants of gradient descent using batching and mini batching and stochastic and then actually using the closed form normal equation. And we can do all of that and the code is succinct, clean, and somebody who looks at it will actually recognize the math behind it. So, like for example, this is the math. So, if I, I uh, there's a lecture that I, I pointed to in the reference um, that talks about how to actually do um, gradient descent for linear regression, where you have to take the partial derivative of each of these dimensions over the set of input vectors. And you land up with something that looks like that. And that translated to code actually looks exactly the same. So you can see that there's a dot product here. There's the subtraction of um, the y-intercept and another dot product with another vector. So even like in terms of being able to look at the code and saying, OK, this sort of mirrors the man. Yeah, the expressivity of the language goes a very, very long way towards, towards doing that. So fundamentally, uh, we benefit from this because we're able to 
compose pieces together. For example, if you go back and look at the code, which I encourage you to do, I will share the, the GitHub link with you. Uh, you can basically look at different uh, ways of putting things together. Like how do you decide when to stop the computation? How do you decide um, in what way you want to compose the composition? Do you want small batches, large batches, single steps at a time? All of those things are compositionally put together. And uh, because the pieces are, are small, they fit in nicely, the language gives us partial application and stuff like that to, to allow us to basically compose things nicely. Um, you can actually write code that's a lot more expressive in F -sharp than you would in say another language. So the conclusion is actually pretty much what I've been banging on about, right? The code is clean and expressive, but we didn't get there by playing code golf and making it difficult to read. We didn't try clever tricks in terms of like trying to compress things. The language just allows us to express things uh, in, a, in a terse way. And the fact that there are no dulls and there's immutability by default basically gives us the ability to uh, express things nicely uh, and also be safe in what we do. And of course, the idiosyncratic features that F# -sharp has, like custom operators and units of measure, and and SRTP constraints and type providers and so on, and in fact, uh, F parsec and so on, um, they they make using F# -sharp a very viable option for scientific computation. And you can actually make it very performant. You can even do it without freaking out Don Syme. Uh, just be a little circumspect about when you tweet. That's really all there is to that. Uh, I, the references are there on the on the on the code for the presentation. I'll, I will leave the slide up for a second, uh, but it's on GitHub. If you follow me on GitHub, you'll be able to see it. I'll tweet this information out, and uh, uh, you know I'm I'm happy to take some questions for the last couple of minutes. Um, and with that, I'm done. Cool. It looks like uh, we have uh, no questions, so I will uh, return some time. And uh, uh, I look forward to seeing the next uh, talk, actually. Um, I haven't seen Mark in a while. I strongly encourage you to hang around and listen to Mark Seaman. He's a, he, he a fascinating uh, um, a speaker. Ah, as for performance, now I think this we should take offline. Um, I don't think we should we should compare those two apples. They're not the same fruit. Thank you very much for a great talk. Um, there's plenty of comments, but I think it's in the traditional academic style. This is more of a comment than a question. But they're all oh they're all positive, which is not in the traditional <laughs> academic style. So very good. All right. Um, There's a reason I didn't get into academia. Uh, <laughs> this, I think I just figured out why. Uh, I mean, we've got two minutes. There's a, there's a real question here. Mention yeah. missing generic modules. But why not use interfaces and inner inheritance for this case? Yeah, you can, and I tried to beat that thing, but it looked it looked more like I was trying to beat the solution to shape rather than letting the solution evolve into the shape that it needed to be in. And in some sense, this isn't an interface. It it does not use inheritance. This is not an it is not a typical uh, object oriented paradigm. What we're really saying is, I've got a lattice of some size, and I'm going to do something with it. You know, really. These are two important parameters, and the stuff I'm going to do is is not is not an object. It's not an object. We're not dealing with objects in that sense. So inheritance, you could you could kind of shoehorn the solution into that form, but it 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 it, it takes away from the elegance of the solution. I think. Thanks. Well, let's thank John again. Do, 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 do. Thank you. Um, thanks, thanks. Uh, this is this is not fun because you can't hear all the all the two hundred people clapping yes, for how yes. many have we got. Um, but it was really amazing. Thanks a lot, John. Thanks. Thank thanks you for stopping by. Take it was care. amazing.
Thanks.